Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. It is December 11th, 2014, just like the last one. I am uh, <laughs> trying to get these done because I'm, I, 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 I read quite a bit while I was sick. We're actually caught up to where I was now, so, uh, you know, I, I was reading this book on its own because I knew that I wanted it to have its own episode where I also talked about 3rd edition as a whole. So, um, uh, Gauntelgrim, the first of the Neverwinter series of Drizzt books, is what we're talking about. Ari Salvatore, of course. And I, I guess I should really talk about 3rd edition first, but I want to go ahead and talk about this book and get that out of the way. This was an odd, odd Drizzt book. I honestly don't know where to start here. There are things in this book that amazed me and really impressed me, and... This is the book that I wanted the Transitions trilogy, any of those books, to be. The Transitions trilogy I just thought was so weak and so silly and not really... Like, it just never it just never went anywhere or did anything. This book, however, suffers from a few things, uh, and, and we'll get into that in a minute, but the things that hit really hit well. So, for instance, we... we Jumpstart pretty quickly. Well, first we do this thing where, of course, Brunor dies. And it's like, oh, that's really sad. And I was like, wow, I'm kind of surprised they did that in the beginning. But they faked it, shocker. Uh, and, and so it's Brunor wanting to go out and adventure because he's like, I'm sick and tired of being a king. And I know that my successor is going to do a good job. So he and Drizzt go out traveling to find Gauntelgrim. And, or no, I guess that originally they're going out to try to find, or no, they're going to go find Gauntelgrim and Jarlaxle is tasked with trying to find Cadibri and Regis's ghosts, which seems an odd thing to me. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you're in this sort of world. I don't know. I like, it just seems a really dumb way to deal with death, but whatever. And then they, like, find, apparently, the the cops where they live. And they miss him by a few minutes or something. And it was like, well, what the hell was the point of all this? It really just felt like it was Salvatore saying, okay, look, you know, I'm, I, I want to go back there too, but we just aren't doing it. And I was like, thank God, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really interested to see where everything goes without that sort of crutch. And Thibbledorf Quint finds out, and he comes along with him, and my favorite scene by far in this book is the book, or is the section where it's, I don't know, I want to say like maybe 50, 30, 40 years, 30, 40 years after they set out. And so we're, I, I think we're around 1450 or so. I, I can't remember the dates in here, but uh, I think the next one starts in 1469 and that's where we end. Uh, so I think it's about the, uh, God, I, 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 I don't, hold on. Okay, so the book's prologue is 1409 and that's where the death is faked. Then we skip to 1451 for part one, and part two is 11 years after that, 1462. So uh, somewhere, I, I, I think actually towards the beginning of part one, maybe it's towards the end, but somewhere in part one, there's this section, there's this scene where Wibbledorf Puent, who's, you know, I, I, I don't think as old as Brunor, but he's been this battle rager. He's, you know, throwing himself all over the place and getting into battle all the time. And he's just basically like, I can't, go back on the road with you, because, like, every winter they winter somewhere because it's just too damn cold to go around looking for things, and he's like, look, I'm too damn old and useless, and uh, they have to accept that, holy hell, you know, I mean, uh, mortality catches us all, right? And I thought it was a, a moving scene. I thought it worked pretty well. Of course he comes back for the finale, and it's like, what the hell are you doing here, Thwibbledorf? And it just, it's just ridiculous, and, uh, oh god, what's his name, Arbogast or whatever, Jarlaxle's dwarf sidekick now, is here through the whole thing, and Brunor is finally kind of, you know, I can kind of deal with him now, or whatever, and I'm trying to remember, I, I can't remember if Thwibbledorf or Brunor die at the end of this, I, I, possibly both. But it's, you know, I'm just not trusting anything at this point, uh, especially because I have read the plot synopsis of Salvatore's latest, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, really, man? So, you know, it's uh, it's whatever, but let's try to pay attention to where we are. So a lot of the, a, a lot of the, uh, the whole letting go of the past worked really well here, I thought, until Salvatore brought it back into our face. But just the fact that, you know, they talk about things like uh, fighting the Ghost King at Catterley's place 
and it's like that was four decades ago you know i mean it's 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 like these things it it it's an interesting thing because I, I think kind of a, a trope in modern fantasy is to use these characters who are past their prime. You know, they've seen all the fighting and they're grizzled old veterans now and, and they're main characters rather than uh, the characters who are the young novices, right? It's, it's a very strange feeling to be reading a character who, has, who we've actually seen go through all of these things. You know, I mean... So, like, for instance, you know, unlike the the Malazan series, which I love, where we start with book one and they're referencing a lot of things that have happened and, and we don't see them, you know, and, and that's fine uh, because, you know, your series just can't be eight million <laughs> words long unless you're R.A. Salvatore. And it's like reading about these things, you're like, yeah, God, I remember that book, you know, uh, I remember reading that. And it's a weird sort of feeling and it... Uh, lends things a, a kind of honest credence, I think. So those parts of the book I enjoyed. The climax is way too goddamn long. The climax is like 30% of the book, and it should have been like 20 pages max. It's just stuff that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and doesn't really go anywhere, and you basically know where it's going. You know, it's just... it's There's no surprises in the end of the book. And um, I, I, I just kept thinking, like, okay, okay, just be done. And that's why I don't really remember the end, because I was just rushing through it so fast that I was like, oh, I just, I don't care. I'm, I'm curious to see where things go next, though, because I, I did enjoy a lot of this. And I think, I, I really think Brunor might be dead. I'm crossing, I'm fingers crossed here. It's not that I hate him, but I just think his time is done, you know. It's, it's, it's time to do some new stuff, and I wish Jarl Axel's sidekick would just friggin' die already. Fun little thing here. Word that I learned from it. Pyroclast. It's the noun form of the adjective pyroclastic, which means relating to, consisting of, or denoting fragments of rock erupted by a volcano. Pyroclast. So there. Always trying to teach new words here on Realms Remembered, so uh, that's that's an exciting one to add to the uh, to the toolkit. The other note that I have in here concerns a character who I find it difficult to talk about because you know how last time I talked about this not feeling like the Realms. Well, this really didn't feel like the Realms. There is a sexual sadist <laughs> in this book who. We see basically rape a man and keeps him near death until she's had her way with him and reminisces about the other times that she's done it and enjoyed it and uh, there is and kills a baby uh, in a flashback and so it's like this is one of our main characters and while I applaud Salvatore for putting a character who's not you know goody two shoes or a hundred percent wants to be reformed and you know Jarl Axel has to talk her into joining the party well while I say good for that on the other hand I'm like this doesn't really I I don't know it just feels off to me I'm you know I'm I'm no prude and I'm not against it but I'm like whoa really this is this is what you wanted to do with essentially your introduction to 4th edition? All right. You know, it's kind of like how day one in the DC New 52, they were like, how about if the Joker rips his own face off? Or has his face ripped off? And it was like, you know, that's maybe a story that you could have done at the end of the old DC universe rather than starting out, but whatever. So the sexual sadist, Drizzt kind of likes her because... and. I, <laughs> Well, that sounds odd, but Driz kind of likes her because he is uh, uh, in a dark place now, and the only real joy that he gets is through battle, and she's really, really good in battle, and so he just, he's he's kind of, you know, he's grooving with her. Like, they, they get along in that, like, Amazonian sense or Spartan sense or something. And to show us this, Salvatore gives us this uh, two-sentence paragraph, and I will try to inflect it this way, both sentences end with exclamation points. Drizzt couldn't tear his eyes from her. If another enemy had crept in and charged at him, he surely would have been cut down. He's so excited that he could die. Oh, boy. Man, Salvatore. There were a lot of times in here where I was just like, man, he just really hasn't gotten much better over time. And that's sad. I mean, he has some things that kind of resonate simply because of the story, but I don't know if it's 
editors or what. But anyway, first half of the book, pretty good. I enjoyed it. So we're really just hip deep in 4th edition at this point. I mean, we're there's no turning back, really. I'm sure we'll get flashbacks and stuff. But we are, for all intents and purposes, just in the 15th century now. And uh, the world is different. I will say this this felt more like a Realms book overall than the Abolithic Sovereignty. The only thing that really struck me as 4th edition-y, rather than just like, what the hell, Salvatore, was the fact that uh, the big thing they're fighting at the end of this, in Gauntlegrim, obviously they find it, is uh, a primordial. Oh, that's that's another kind of fun thing, and it's it's like, I don't even think to talk about this stuff because I had the Neverwinter Adventure Guide or Supplement or whatever you want to call it before I lost it in the move, and I had read through that, and I really liked that. I thought it was a fun sandboxy thing. And you get to kind of see a lot of that stuff here. So, like, that's where the ten, ten-year break happens is when the mountain explodes and takes out the city of Neverwinter. And so I'm I'm really excited to see more adventures actually in Neverwinter because really our main characters aren't in Neverwinter much. It's mostly, you know, the first half is them wandering around and then the second half is them going into Gauntlegrim. And there's a little bit of overlap with Neverwinter, but I'll, I'll be interested to see if there's more stuff with Neverwinter, especially because at least in the Neverwinter sandbox book, the Abolethic Sovereignty was active there, and I'm kind of curious to see if they deal with that any in here. But they're, you know, obviously in secret, so maybe it just never comes up, but we'll see. Oh, the other thing at least worth mentioning is there's a character in here, Barabbas the Grey, and because I've looked around, I know who that character is, and I've got to say, I'm curious, does anybody remember... Did everybody see through that? Because knowing who the character is, when I read it, I was just like, well, this is obvious. I mean, this isn't like, like, this is absolutely obvious. It's not even, he's not even hiding who this character is. I mean, it's just, it's just out there. But then I thought, if I didn't know, and especially because, you know, I don't read Salvatore super closely, would I have, would I have gotten it? So I don't know. Um, so I'm curious, was was Barabbas the Grey really a big reveal whenever they do reveal it? Or was everybody just like, yeah, this is obviously so-and-so? And I'm not saying it just in case you don't know and you haven't read it and you 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 give a damn. Because I don't mind spoilering up to the book that we're on, but I don't want to give a spoiler for something later down the road. But let's just say that he's Barabbas the Grey because his skin has a grey pallor and he is a sarcastic assassin. And he used to be human once. So, I mean, come on, right? I mean, come on. Anyway. So I don't know if I have a lot to say about 3rd edition overall. I remember at the end of 2nd, beginning of 3rd, there was a lot of emphasis on shadow magic. I recall that being a thing. Shadow magic and sorcerers. They just kind of seem to be a given at this point, although it seems as if everybody is just kind of a magic user still. You know, I, I, I feel like Sorcerer is used interchangeably a lot of times. I see Sorcerers still using magical ingredients and so on and so forth. So I don't know if that really made a difference. Beyond that, Third just wasn't really... I, I mean... There were a few minor tweaks, especially the shadow magic and sorcerers, and the fact that druids were badass, but really, I don't remember any book besides, what was it, Temple Hill, where druids were portrayed as awesome as they were in that book. You know, there wasn't really much of a tonal shift, if you will. It was just kind of, I don't want to say it was more of the same, but it was kind of keep on keeping on, you know? And and so, I except for... Abolethic Sovereignty, I haven't felt like anything uh, went astray or, or, or went into some sort of areas that just didn't work. Uh, it still felt unified to me. It probably felt more unified. I mean, we were in Sembia forever. It honestly felt like we, we didn't see as much of the world as we did in 2nd edition. It seriously feels like 3rd edition was like Sembia... And then all the closing trilogies, because, you know, we've been in these closing trilogies forever, man. We've, we we had Transitions, which really wasn't a closing trilogy at all. I mean, what, what like, Luskin's change? That's, like, the really the only thing that was a very, like, big uh, change that happened in there that I can think of. You know, I mean, everything else is so provincial that it's kind of like, well, who cares? I'm trying to think of something else to say about all these closing trilogies. Man, there have just been so many of them. 
I'm not against them, and I'm en- I've enjoyed almost all of them. You know, we had, uh, what, Empyrean Odyssey, the Twilight War, the Haunted Lands trilogy, which we haven't quite finished yet. Possibly the Transitions trilogy with Drizzt, if you want to count that. The Abolithic Sovereignty trilogy, I mean, that's 15 books. They're right alone, and, and I think at least two of those had... Uh, Uh, At least three of those had anthologies to go with it. So it's, you know, we've just had, I I mean, like, when we came into third edition, it was Return of the Archwizards, and I guess kind of that, uh, whatever that Greenwood trilogy was, Cloak of Shadows or whatever. And when we came into second edition, it was basically, or was that second edition? I think that was second edition. I think it was really just Return of the Archwizards for third edition. And when we came into uh, second edition, it was the uh, uh, the Avatar trilogy and the the Shadows trilogy, and and that was it. You know, it was it was one. It was kind of a very distinctive set of circumstances. And here, it's just like the world has been topsy turvy for quite some time now. And now we've taken such a huge jump. It's very difficult to feel any sense of continuity. Even even with the Drizzt stuff. I mean, it's it's really basically Drizzt and Jarlaxle and Barabbas. Barabbas, whatever. I mean, that's assuming Brunor died. Uh, if he didn't, then I guess Brunor as well. And Athrogate or whatever he is. You know, there are only kind of constants in this world. Uh, it, it feels very much like they're almost Captain America's, you know, men out of time in this very different world at this point. We'll see how that works out and if... if if you know if that works okay if that feels all right uh, i'm not sad to see third edition go i'm i'm excited for the changes and i'm really curious to see how things work out i'm i'm definitely curious to see how some of the authors like to be uh or buyers i i think to be and buyers will really flourish in this new world and i'm curious to see how that works out other people <laughs> You know, I'm I'm kind of in a way glad that some of the people who I really enjoyed are going away. You know, I mean, like Denning, I don't think would really fit in a 4E universe. Uh, so we'll see. Next up, we've got a couple more Drizzt. We're going to keep working our way through this Neverwinter quadrilogy. And uh, if I haven't posted it yet, I'll post. I, I just kind of randomly threw those books that we don't know the date on into 4th edition somewhere. So I'm going to uh, throw up the uh, 4E Credo or whatever you want to call it for what we're going to cover in what order from here on out. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered. <laughs>